My name is Edmund Clark. I'm an artist and photographer and I have an exhibition at the Imperial War Museum. Essentially it's about unseen processes and sites and experiences of the war on terror, uh, particularly in relation to control and incarceration. The exhibition covers about 10 years of my work. The prison camps at Guantanamo Bay and the experience of the people held there, um, the CIA secret prison program um, and the process called Extraordinary Rendition and um, a form of control called a control order used in the United Kingdom to hold terrorism suspects under a form of detention without trial based on secret evidence. I'm more interested in the way images work in a much broader way, um, the way we have responded to the imagery of the war on terror we've seen on our screens and through the propaganda videos that we have seen. What has inspired me, I mean, kind of most directly initially, would be um, the sight of the, um, the images which came from Guantanamo Bay on the first day, men in orange jumpsuits shackled and bound and gagged um, with the message that these were the worst of the worst. Um, and then the contrast between that image and when the first British detainees came back from Guantanamo Bay and they were held for one night in a police station and then released uh, completely free without any kind of charge brought against them at all. So it's that contrast between uh, what happened to these men and the representation which was attached to them and still attaches to them. So that contrast inspired me. It's connection between these geopolitical and global events, which it's very easy to imagine are uh, things carried out by government agencies um, and which we only see on our television screens and are therefore very distant from us. But it brings those down to a level which we can all relate to. Uh, and by showing those spaces in relation to these people and saying this is about terror, it is making a connection, I hope, for my audiences between the experience of the individuals I've worked with and these global events and themes which my work is trying to explore. And I suppose the other element that comes out through my work and the way in which I have photographed locations and used um, very ordinary kind of bureaucracy about locations is it's bringing it down to the everyday level at which we live. Negative publicity artifacts of extraordinary rendition came about through um, my relationship with and collaboration with Croft and Black, um, the counterterrorism investigator and researcher. It's about the CIA secret prison program. You know those um, sites and the documentation are very normal, very ordinary, and what that work is saying is that this is not a process run by the CIA, not a process run by a secret government agency. It was something which was outsourced. Uh, it was privatised. Negative publicity kind of grew out of work I'd been doing at the NGO Reprieve. We were trying to show that particular individuals had been rendered and held in secret detention in various countries in Europe. Now the sites which I've then gone and photographed as an extension of that in response to that documentation, um, a lot of those are again very ordinary places. They are in the homes of people who have been subject to those experiences. Um, they are also airports, small airfields, um, quiet suburbs in Eastern European cities where a CIA black site was housed, a small hamlet in a forest outside the capital of, of, of Lithuania in Vilnius. That's where a CIA black site was located. These are very ordinary places, but this is where these, these kind of events were taking place. Um, all the documentation in um, the book has been, is in the public domain in some form, um, but has not been necessarily connected to this process. There are, there are no leaks in this information. It's, it's not information that was, say, improperly accessed from the CIA or the US government. It's all information that ended up in the public domain um, for one reason and another. We would use things like obviously declassified US government documents that had been published. We would use court cases. I made lots of freedom of information requests. I think I made freedom of information requests in maybe 28 different countries. Um, I worked with the European Parliament in order to get access to centrally held 
flight data um, that was held in Brussels, which could confirm and corroborate the movements of the planes that I was looking at. And then the photographs I started making in response to that, to, to that material and to that visual language, themselves became, in a sense, about um, a, an idea of facades and um, the hidden, um, and almost the limit of photography. You know, I can't enter a black site, a former black site, but all I can do is photograph around it. I can photograph the facades of companies in um, America that have run this process. One of the strands in the work is that I was able to find out the locations where pilots who had been flying these rendition flights lived in America. Um, and I went and photographed three of these homes, um, which I ultimately ended up censoring myself. I mosaicked out the area where these houses existed in the photographs. It's um, almost recreating uh, these networks of mundanity, these very ordinary pieces of documentation, invoices, billing reconciliations, flight schedules, making those connections to ordinary small airfields, to people's offices. These are very ordinary things, but they are charged with some significance, with a political significance, because they are reconstructing, they are part of the network of extraordinary rendition that was about the detention, interrogation and rendition programme, which was about extrajudicial torture. In Guantanamo, I was very clear that I didn't want to take photographs the way I had seen them being taken before, uh, which was images of detainees and the guards, which you know, you're not allowed to identify people when you're there. So I'd seen a lot of press agency imagery which was showing me kind of out of focus people or shackled hands, shackled ankles or just camouflaged bodies. I was very clear I didn't want to do that so I went with a larger, a large format camera or a very large digital camera and photographed space and photographed objects. Um, I was also aware that my work was going to be censored and I, when you go to Guantanamo you have to agree not to photograph certain things. So I was interested how that process of censorship would re reflect in my work and how that would reflect, in a sense, the forms of control which were being exercised in Guantanamo. The work I did about Guantanamo Bay actually took about three years, um, but of that time I, only, I spent nine days in Guantanamo itself. Getting access took about six months. Eventually I was given permission to go for two days. And I said, well, that's not enough. I'm coming all the way from London. I want to do all this work on the naval base as well. So, very fortunately, I was able to go for nine days, which is much longer than you normally get. Um, I was there in April after President Obama came to power. And the first thing he had said when he came to power was that he was going to close Guantanamo within a year. So there was um, yeah, a... Um, an element of transparency about the place when I was there, so I was fortunate that was the case. The extra time that I had there meant that I could ask to go to places to see things which I knew were there, but which you don't normally see. So those elements kind of came together to allow me, to afford me, to get into sites, aspects, elements, parts of the prison which are normally closed. I asked to photograph a mobile force feeding chair, or perhaps more accurately, a mobile enteral feeding chair. That's the phrase they use, enteral feeding, kind of through a tube. I asked specifically the admiral in charge of the camps at the time to photograph one of those, and he said, OK. Uh, those chairs are the same chairs which are used in American prisons, by the way. There's nothing remarkable about that. That equipment is standard issue in American prisons. Um, Force feeding as we know it in Guantanamo is um, represented as a part of the duty of care. So there's a photograph in the book, which is not in, in the exhibition, um, in the prison camp hospital, where in this ward of about eight beds, which were all empty when I was there, I came across this small display of tins of product and a coiled tube, and that's the product of the tube which are used for enteral feeding, for force feeding. 
But in Guantanamo at that time, it was represented to you, presented to you as part of the duty of care of looking after these people, of stopping them harming themselves through um, denying themselves food, through going on hunger strike. But, of course, false feeding is legally, technically, a form of torture. One of the photographs in the exhibition is of the equipment used by what's known as the Immediate Response Force or the Emergency Response Force, the IRF team. Um, those are the people who uh, go into a cell when there's a problem. Um, so each member of that team has a role to go in and uh, subdue, suppress the individual, then each person is responsible for a particular limb. While I was working on Guantanamo, um, I found out about control orders in the United Kingdom, uh, which have been brought in in 2005, um, which are a form of detention without trial, based on, I think the legal phrase at that time was a reasonable suspicion. The Home Secretary just had to have a reasonable suspicion that someone was involved with some form of terrorist-related activity. That's part of this kind of shift in moral, legal, ethical norms that our societies have gone through in the war on terror. And I wanted to do something about it, I wanted to respond to that in some way. So the man in that house was tagged, he had to live under a curfew, he could only move within a certain area around the house. I had access for a short period of time to the house where this terrorism suspect was living. So I took the approach there where I worked with a much smaller format camera and I just photographed every inch, every centimetre of every room and worked very automatically. I went into a room and just started in, the, in a corner and rotated and photographed and photographed and photographed in a very automatic way. Uh, so those, those photographs look nothing like the pictures I took in Guantanamo Bay, but what I then did was reproduce them um, in the order in which I took them. So you can see where I'm changing lenses, you can see how I'm thinking photographically, but then the photographs themselves become about order and control because the way in which I have taken them and the way in which I reproduce them and I just reproduce them with the basic JPEG number is in a sense giving up my control as a photographer. They are unedited. The viewer gets to see the whole of the house twice so that is a process where the formal way of taking the pictures reflects control and order and evokes surveillance um, and evokes claustrophobia. What I'm trying to do is quite simply just to engage people enough for them to stop and have pause for thought. That's all I can do as an artist, is try and engage people to think differently, to have knowledge that they didn't have before. <laughs>